Okay, so let's start with the descriptive uh, part of what I called mapping health data. So we, most of you are paid here or you work uh, in order to describe uh, one nice data in factor of your job. And uh, actually mapping is probably the most efficient way to describe data uh, in space. And it's, it's, it's actually uh, it's quite efficient and it's much easier to interpret data on a map when you can map it than on a table. Another thing maybe which is quite important is that people, uh, people tend to like maps. People tend to like maps a lot. Uh, whether they are uh, you know, public health uh, professionals, but also uh, people who take decisions, uh, they, they tend to prefer to visualize the data. And a map is a nice way to visualize them. And as we will see during the, uh, the case studies and during, during examples, on a map, you can convey quite a lot of information. Not, not only the geographical distribution, but also the intensity of the phenomenon you are studying. Okay? So these are basic concepts, which uh, I think it's nice to, to summarize them. So in, in our daily work, uh, uh, as I think you mostly work in surveillance units, or uh, at least you, you deal with surveillance, uh, we usually are dealing with data that is aggregated, that are aggregated at the regional districts or postcode level, okay? And what we can do, and what we often do, is to, to estimate the incidence by, the, by dividing the number of cases per district or per geographical unit by the population at risk. And uh, one of the resulting indicators, which is often used by us, is the incidence. And we can classify the different districts in a, in a, in a class or in a in a, in a category according to the incidence. And to do this, you don't really need a, you don't need a GIS, so to speak. What you need first, and that's that we're going to come back to the issue of the, the attributable table behind any data, is a table with your data organized by the spatial unit. Okay? This is just a simple example of, of a, a list of Italian regions for which I have a one line corresponding to one region in a database. And so I have the ID of the region, the name of the region, and I can have data such as the number of cases of a disease, the population at risk, and I, calculate, I can calculate an indicator uh, for that disease, so instance, the incidence per 100,000 people. Right? What I need as well is what we will call a base map. Okay, so that's a map of the area divided by the geographical units I'm going to work with. In this case, the region. Okay? So far, so good. So here is my base map of Italy with my 21 regions. And I'm going to map the indicator, the EP indicator which I have built in my table, on that base map. This was done here in this example for Italy for, uh, for the incidence of reported measles per 100,000 inhabitants in 2007, 2008, okay? So for each, for each unit, geographical unit, for each polygon, we assign a color which is equivalent to, or which corresponds to a level of incidence, the main classes. And that's what we called a chloropleth map. And it's very, it's very widely used in, in, in EPI. And again, for this, you don't need very sophisticated software. You could do this in theory using a PowerPoint, uh, a PowerPoint, or you know, we could draw a map in, in Word. Even though it's not very, uh, might not be very time, eff time uh, effective, but you can do it. You don't need a GIS, basically. And it is, uh, it is purely descriptive. So you're not going to test an hypothesis, but you're going to generate hypothesis. It's a nice way to generate hypothesis. You see, I mean, consider this as a type of you know, the same, same logic as an epic curve. It will help you to generate hypothesis. Uh, so for, for coming back to the Italian map of measles, <coughs> I'm going I'm to generate hypothesis. Is there a higher risk in the, in the northern regions? It seems to be. Uh, how, how can this be? Is, there, is this linked to the climate in the north? So I'm already thinking in also uh, in terms of risk factors. Is it because the vaccine coverage is lower in the north and high in the south? 
Is it simply because the North is reporting more cases because its surveillance system is more complete? Actually, during my EPI fellowship, most of the most most of the maps of Italy looked like that. Yeah. <laughs> very, very dark colors in the North and uh, lighter colors in the South. <laughs> So, so anyway, the logic here being that maps are quite useful to, uh, to describe the disease in, uh, in, uh, that you're studying and to generate hypotheses. Um, mapping has, has some limitations. Uh, some of the limitations are directly linked to the, to the geographical aspect of the, of the exercise. Some of them are just due to the well, are very uh, common to any surveillance data. Maybe two things, two things that are uh, <coughs> specific to mapping, uh, to the exercise of mapping limitations. The first one is called the uh, modifiable area unit problem. Uh, it's the fact that the geographical scale of the units that we're using to map uh, the indicator um, is usually an administrative boundary, which does not necessarily have any uh, epidemiological meaning or representative meaning. Okay, so we we'll usually will be we'll have to work with the units given to us by the by the administrative the, the, the political boundaries of, of the country or the area we study. And I will tell you, I will show you examples why this might be a problem. The second problem, or it's not a problem, but it's a challenge, or at least something you have to keep in mind when you look at a map or when you do a map is that uh, the variable that you are showing, and therefore the, the colors that you're using, uh, and the choice of the, the, the classes, the methods to do the classes, will, will influence the way the map looks, and therefore the way it will interpret the map. So we'll have to be careful on the choice of, of classes and colors you use. I put in second position here data quality, just to remind you that uh, mapping your data does not improve the quality of your data, okay? Uh, although it, may, it might look better on a map than on a table, it doesn't mean that you erase biases or errors uh, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that is in your surveillance data or your survey data. It does not remove confounding factors. And there's the issue of random variation, especially for areas or units for which the population at risk, the denominator is very small. And you could have, uh, and for those units in particular, uh, one case might lead to a very high uh, uh, perceived incidence or risk, which might just be, just be linked to the fact that you have a very small denominator. And you have to be careful about this as well. And there, there are, there are techniques to deal with that. So just to illustrate the problem of the modifiable area unit problem, this is, these are three maps uh, taken from a study which um, uh, focused on the association between uh, lead and um, lead poisoning and the, on the, the, uh, the, uh, the percentage of homes that were built before a certain date. And lead, lead or lead poisoning? Is it lead? Lead. Lead, lead poisoning, sorry. It's in the US. And so what they did, they mapped, therefore, the percentage of housing units uh, that were built before a certain date, 1950s, in New Jersey, uh, at different level, uh, geographical level, right? Usually our maps, let, let's say, are, uh, are based on counties or district levels. And they did the same, they, they took the same data and they mapped it also at a, at a zip code level and at the block groups, which, is, which are smaller geographical units. And what you can see, of course, you, you are losing information when you use larger geographical area. Uh, you, you losing information in the sense that in one, in one large block there might be different pockets of high incidence or higher percentage that you might not see when you use such boundaries. Uh, and, and this is, of course, uh, something that you will lose by, by using bigger, larger uh, geographical units. If you take, for instance, this, this particular county, 
it does not mean that the uh, percentage of, of housing units with uh, houses older than uh, 1950s was very low. There are pockets of high, high density, as you can see in the, the more detailed maps. And usually, in surveillance data, we are, we are using quite large geographical units. Yeah. So there is um, a difference between this data and the data we use in, in epidemiology. It's known from, from theory and practice that small populations have very, very uh, high variations in the estimates. So it's, it's a tendency in small, small areas that you find high incidence, although there are three people also. So there's a... you have to deal with it. Yeah. You can right. have a wrong impression by the small area yeah. map as well. That's, yeah, that's, a, that's a very good point. That's another, another limitation of mapping. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, the big, big units with small, small population denominator have a high variability. So what you see on the map might just reflect this high variability. And there are some uh, smoothing techniques to adjust for that. Uh, this is another example, and this is to illustrate the fact that the discretization method, the way you, you make the categories for the incidence or the indicator level, might influence how the map looks like. This is, this is France, this is a map of France, <coughs> showing a male mortality rate per 1,000 inhabitants by a zone d'emploi, so it's a small district, for, uh, for the period 1988 to 92. Okay? Uh, so, mortality rate in France by district. This, this, this gives you the distribution, so the number of districts for each corresponding value of mortality rate. Okay? And in this particular map, the author used the equal interval method to map the indicator. Meaning that the, the f here he used six categories and the interval uh, between uh, of each class is equal, so it actually cuts it cut the distribution with equal making equal intervals uh, in, in the classes, and this is the, the resulting map of that indicator. Okay. Now, using exactly the same data, exactly the same period, but a different method of discretization, namely the quantile method. So now the interval is not the same in the distribution, but the number, the number of districts are the same in each interval. It's the same indicator, you get this map, which looks fairly different, okay? So here it's, uh, it's to tell you that uh, same data, using the same geographical units, can be mapped in very different ways depending on the on the classification of the discretization methods you use to map the data. <coughs> and they're, both, they're both correct, uh, but as you can see they show, uh, they show a fairly different map. This is another example, rounded value method, where the, the, the boundary of the classes are uh, rounded values, so 50, 70, 90, etc. And again, the color or the patterns on the map uh, are quite different. So when you when you do a simple map as was done by the by the Italian authors of the Mesel study, uh, you do not uh, adjust for confounders. However, there are methods to adjust for some basic confounders. Um, uh, this is done when you when you do when you map instead of mapping the, the crude incidence when you map the standardized morbidity or mortality ratio. Uh, it's a way of refining the map. And this SMR, so the standardized mortality or morbidity ratio, is a ratio of the observed number of cases or deaths <coughs> in, in a particular area, which is assumed to follow a, a Poisson distribution. And we'll come back to that uh, with examples tomorrow. Uh, divided, so that's the numerator, and the, the denominator is the expected number of cases in that particular unit given the age and sex distribution. Okay? So um, in maps you can also therefore take into account for 
third, uh, third factors which might confound the association between uh, the disease and what you're studying, in, in this case, the geographical unit. And it's, it's a type of, of indirect standardization, okay? So you, you we will be mapping, and you will be mapping some more refined indicators, not just incidence. And that's, that's one example here of, of, uh, of, of the mapping of such an indicator. This is the standardized morbidity, morbidity rate for leukemia in, uh, in England uh, for the period 1974 to 86. Uh, so that's the standardized uh, morbidity rate. So taking into account age and sex for each district. And here quickly we come back to the uh, issues that you raised. In some, in some of these uh, districts, the population was very low, so the denominator was very low. Uh, and in other words, when you had one case of leukemia in such a district, the incidence or the standardized mortality rate looked very, very high. Or in, other, or in another case, when you didn't have any case, it looked very, 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 very low. And uh, this has to be taken into account, and can be taken into account, by using smoothing techniques. So you will not just, for any, for any, uh, any ward or any district, you will not just take the standard mortality rate of that particular district, but it will be smoothed out, weighted by the surrounding districts. Okay? And there are statistical <coughs> methods that, uh, that, are, that are used uh, to do that. And it, it gives you a more, a more stable map uh, as it smooths out those, those uh, extreme variation uh, that are, that are uh, due to the small uh, population denominator, usually in, in urban, rural areas, which are quite large, so they, they appear quite big on the map, but the population denominator is very small. Okay, so that's, so in a way, you can map simple indicators, but you fairly quickly uh, go into some limitations, such as the fact that uh, you do not take into account for third factors. And we can do, you can adjust for that in the map by calculating the standardized mortality rate or standardized morbidity rate. And you can also smooth out for the uh, random variation, which are quite high in, in the low population area, by, by using smoothing techniques and there are different smoothing techniques. Okay, um, so that was more the descriptive, the descriptive part of, the, of, the, uh, of, of mapping. Um, mapping, uh, mapping techniques are quite useful also in, in studies, in epidemiological studies, and in particular in um, ecological study. So here we want to assess the correlation between um, a disease on an on a aggregated level, district, regional, uh, zip code level, and some factors such as environmental variables or socioeconomic and demographic uh, variables, and so on and so forth. And as you would remember from your, from your IPA times and uh, even before, these studies are not like case control, individual based uh, case control or cohort studies. And it's, they suffer from the ecological fallacy. Okay? And they're generally used to generate, well, they're generally done to generate hypotheses rather than to test hypotheses. Now, mapping is, can be quite useful for the, uh, for the ec ecological <coughs> that, uh, try to study the association between the disease and some environmental variables. And, this is where, these are examples of studies where GIS becomes useful. And I will, I will, this is one example taken from uh, Uganda who is uh, studying the, uh, the risk factors for plague in rural, in rural villages of, uh, of Uganda. So the, the level here is the village, which is a dot, uh, which is a dot in, that, uh, in that picture. Uh, so it's aggregated, so it's whether a village had ever recorded a, uh, a, a case of plague in the last uh, five years. And one of the environmental factors that they're studying is the land cover, okay? So the, 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 uh, the vegetation where the village is located. 
And uh, one method to do this is to use uh, satellite pictures uh, with remote sensing data, which gives you information on the type of vegetation in, on each, each location on the map or on each pixel on the map. And therefore, you can classify each village or each unit uh, as far as the vegetation is concerned and make a simple correlation between this kind of environmental factors and the presence or absence of disease or the incidence of disease. So it's a type of ecological uh, study where, where you use <coughs> environmental uh, data, uh, in this case that was on a satellite image, and you related it to the, to the geographical unit. This is one example of using different layers of geographic information. And this is where GIS, so the Geographical Information System, becomes useful because it allows you to deal with different layers of information. What do you mean by layers? I mean different uh, level of uh, geographical information like regional, local, village, different level? No, by layer I mean different, the different uh, features, so different nature variables. So the one layer would be here the, the satellite image giving you information on the environmental, on the vegetation index. Okay, that would be one layer. The second layer here would be the actual, the, the village, uh, including the, the incidence of plague in these villages. Another layer could be the uh, socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic index. But the socioeconomic index, you, you don't need really a map to do a correlation between the, the, the incidence and the socio socioeconomic index. For the environmental uh, uh, the vegetation index, the, actually mapping it and making the link between the location of the village and the location of the, of the pixel which contains information on the vegetation, you would need the map to do that and a GIS software to do that. Uh, Thomas, can I just ask, is, is the pale blue shading meant to indicate that there, it's above a certain threshold? Yeah, they actually here yeah, it's not the actual vegetation index. It's it's a they they categorize it in two categories. I think one is dry, uh, it's more dry vegetation. The other one is wet. So it's 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 a binary variable here. Okay. So yeah, so the, the pale the pale uh, pixel or color indicates one type of vegetation, and the blue one indicates another type of vegetation. Okay. And they were therefore able to categorize each village or each unit according to the, the, the type of vegetation. So again, here the I mean it's an ecological study as the the, uh, the unit of uh, of study is not the individual, but it's it's uh, it's actually a village or an aggregation of, of people. And you can you can uh, the output would be used in a well, the output of this classification could be used in a simple. Uh, logistic regression model where you try to, to see if there's an association between that variable and the outcome played in this case. Another example of, of, uh, of um, using geographical data and using the, the let's say the, the, uh, the technology of mapping and GIS in what I call semi-ecological studies so uh, these are studies, and I mean, we can discuss the term semi-ecological study, but this, these are studies where the, the, some data, most of the data are available at the individual level. So it's a kind of, it, it can be used in a case control uh, study or cohort study. Uh, but the exposure status uh, that you will be measuring uh, using the map and the GIS <coughs> will be defined by, let's say, a proxy, uh, a proxy uh, to the real to the real exposure, so the distance from a suspected source will be a proxy of the exposure. Uh, here, I have in mind to just illustrate this, it might be clearer. This is uh, this is a map from um, a town in Norway, um, where you call it did a nice study. Uh, the, the disease it was a Legionella outbreak in Norway, um, and they had they had suspected point source which were cooling towers, um, air scrubbers, etc., etc., and there were point sources. And in this map, what, what you have in, in the red circles, you have the cases of Legionella, 
and in the black, the black triangles represent the, the suspected sources, so the cooling towers, etc. And in orange, you have the, um, the what well, the urban population, so the the general population, so to speak. And uh, so that's that's another example. One layer here would be the one layer in the GIS in in the map would be the, the suspected sources, so the layer, the, the, the black triangles. Another layer would be the cases, the, the, red, uh, the red dots. And what they did here, they did, uh, they did a case cohort study. Okay? So the, the cases were the red dots, and uh, the, the controls the, from, from the cohorts were random sample of the whole population of the town. And for both, for both groups, they were able to uh, define an exposure status uh, defined by the distance from one suspected source. Here, the example is the tower, the cooling tower F, or the scrubber, it was the air scrubber F, uh, for which they were able to define a, what we call a buffer or radius. Uh, in this case, I think it was uh, 10 kilometers or 5 kilometers. And they were therefore able to uh, assign the status of uh, exposed or exposed to their cases and to the, uh, to the population source, the cohort, the population of the cohort. So for instance here, now, now the, uh, the, red, the red squares are the exposed cases. The, the, red, the red dots here are also exposed because they reported during the interviews, they reported having visited these areas. So they're also exposed, although though they, they don't seem to be exposed. <coughs> and the green dots are the non-exposed cases. The, in the cohort, in the, in the source population, uh, the orange, uh, the people living in the orange areas were the, uh, under the buffer, or within the buffer, were the exposed controls. And the people living outside, there were no, no, no cases or random, random sample of the population were the non-exposed controls. And that, therefore, you, you can use a geographical information system or geographical information to, to define the status of your cases and your controls. But here you still need to ask the... the People, if they were in this region, mm -hmm. about non exposed, yeah, the non exposed cases, yeah, the, yeah. the, yeah. the, yeah. the, yeah. yeah, the well, red dot outside the buffer. You mean this, this, yes, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no. yeah, yeah, you, you mean, mean you, don't, that. you don't, okay, so yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Uh, you can make it simple, simpler, but probably losing information when you don't take into account the mobility of the people. In this case, they, they were they went further and they actually asked about the mobility of the people, so. Uh, they ask their, their case, they didn't ask the cohorts. Yeah, but they, they, they complained. Yeah. Was there additional information to pick out this point F? Um, because there are several other points near. Uh, what was the reason why they picked out F? Well, they, they, they did it for all the suspected sources. And that's one, one example of. of, of uh, of method that can be done quite, uh, quite easily within a GIS environment because you take into account distances and you can calculate uh, distance from a suspected source. Well, but you, you, you have to have an idea about the source, especially in environmental outbreaks with common sources. It's very difficult to name five sources. We have this outbreak in Ulm, a similar one. We came up with three or four hundred possible sources. Like, uh, so you only can do that this way if you already have only four, five, or six opportunities. Yeah, they, 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 they were able to focus on a few yeah. sources because they did, uh, they did like biological, they did testing of the, of the water. Okay. Uh, so, that's, so that's another good point. It's, it's, it's in relation with the with other information from your other investigation. And this is an urban outbreak, and with Legionella, probably cooling towers are more spread over the city, but if you look for a more rural source, like farms, they are more clustered together. So if you do the same methods, you cannot discriminate between mm -hmm. nearby farms, because if you look at the attack rates decreasing from the distance from the most likely source, then... You mean they will all be exposed? You know they will all be exposed? 
Now, if it, the farms tend to be more clustered than cooling towers in general. And then they're more clustered in rural areas. Particularly in rural areas. Uh, okay, but these are these are important issues. It doesn't. It's not solved by the by the by the technique or the methods of here, and they should be dealt with by our thinking. So uh, those those last two examples of studies, the, what I call the ecological study and the semi-ecological uh, semi study, they they use this this nice. Uh, this, this nice um, character of GIS, which is being able to um, to analyze the spatial relationships between different types of um, georeference data, okay? Um, the different, what I call the different layers. And one implication is that to do such kind of studies and to do such kind of analysis, you will need uh, georeferenced data, okay? So in this kind of study, just doing it on PowerPoints or on paper is not enough. You will need georeference data, so data which, for which you have the precise geographical coordinates, whether it's, it's a case, whether it's a, a source or an, uh, or an area. And this we'll, we'll, we'll see in the next, next lecture what we mean by georeference data. And the first tutorial will be how to get this kind of data. Okay. Also, in, in the in the uh, the analytical epidemiology part of the of this of this topic of this uh, of this uh, yeah, topic of um, spatial spatial epidemiology, we have what we call clustering and uh, this clustering and detection of clusters, which are slightly different things. We'll have examples of that kind of analysis tomorrow morning uh, with uh, with R. So it requires a bit more uh, uh, difficult, complex statistical analysis. Uh, and the question here that we're going to ask ourselves is, do the, do the cases of disease that, I, that I'm observing, do they tend to occur in proximity to each other? Which, would, which might suggest the fact, or we might suggest that the, uh, the, the, the etiology of the disease is viral. And here I, here I put that most, most, of these, uh, most of these techniques and most of the studies in that field are in environmental epidemiology focusing on chronic diseases, mostly cancer, uh, the, the examples in the literature of mostly leukemia and all sorts of cancer. Okay? So they are non-infectious diseases. And they want, they want to inquire whether there might be an infectious cause of the disease. And the question will be, are the cases that are observed, are they randomly distributed over space, or are they not? And if they're not, it might suggest some, some environmental or infectious cause. <coughs> so the, 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 the question of clustering, and this is one, one, one study from, uh, taken from Gatro, would be, uh, are the, are the cases of uh, childhood leukemia that I'm observing here in West Central Lancashire, are they randomly distributed if I take into account the background population and some well-known risk factors? Are they randomly distributed or are there, do they tend to be more clustered together? Are they, are they, more, are they close uh, from, from one another? And there are statistical methods such as the K function, and we'll see that uh, tomorrow to tell you if they tend, if cases are clustering in a statistically significant manner. Okay? So we will not just look at cases, we will also have to look at controls, because of course what you observe here, the pattern you observe, might just be uh, reflecting the population density. And the question will be, if we take into account population density, underground, uh, underlying population density, do my cases still tend to cluster or not? Thomas, but you have more than the time, not just the special clustering. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. We will focus only on, on spatial. spatial clustering, but it's true that there are techniques which take uh, at the same time both the spatial and time mm -hmm. clustering. 
because yeah, if you want to find, if you want to to prove or to uh, suggest a, um, a real, you know, a, 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 um, environmental cause or a viral cause, you want also to be able to show that it's it's clustered in time. Yeah, and these two that yeah. cluster occur in a time span. I mean, they are in this place for this time, but yeah. it can be different different time periods. Um, re related to that, to that notion of cluster is the uh, of clustering is the, the the actual cluster. Now, there are methods to test for uh, whether there's a cluster around a specific location. It's a bit back to the example of, of Legionella, but here it's, it's a chronic disease. It's lung cancer, so the dots are lung cancer, and the authors ask themselves: Are my lung cancer cases clustered around this? this source here, it's an incinerator, uh, and there are techniques again to show whether cases uh, tend to cluster around a particular source, not just overall clustering, but uh, testing clustering around, or one particular cluster around one source, or, or several sources. Now a few, a few words on, on the, the, the nature of, of uh, the data that you would be using to do such, uh, such studies or such uh, descriptive uh, analysis or descriptive studies is the fact that um, when you're dealing with georeference data or spatial data uh, you have to keep in mind that um, there are con confidentiality issues which might not be the case when you draw uh, an epi curve because attached to a a point, a specific point in, t uh, in, in space, or attached to a specific small geographic area, you have you have an address, and therefore you can you can go easily go back to a neighborhood or even an individual. So you have to, to consider these data as as confidential. That's quite I think quite important to uh, to state. Um, so to su to summarize briefly, so. Um, We've seen, and I think you know already, that mapping is a, is a is a powerful descriptive tool. You can you can map standardized indicators to take into account for uh, confounders. You can smooth out maps to to obtain more stable indicators because of the of the of the problem of the uh, of the issues linked to the fact that some denominators might be very small and therefore you have a high variability. Um, mapping and especially GIF, GIS capabilities is, is quite useful in, in epi studies using uh, geographical information such, such as land cover or distance to a source as a risk factor. And that's more and more widely used in environmental epidemiology. And there there are those more advanced statistical methods that we'll cover tomorrow which will allow you to test for, for clustering and for specific clusters. Uh, both in time and space, although we will focus on space, uh, space clusters. Okay, are there any questions on that very general presentation? Or comments or anything I understand? Always combination I think ever is uh, mapping for the set plus case control study. This is something we can find really what was using. So if you combine this mapping with the case control study, this is um, we had this in Q fever several times. It's it's a possibility to come.